This is Roger Simon for Pajamas Media, and I'm here with Nina Easton, who I remember from her stint at the Los Angeles Times. She's now a Washingtonian. Uh, she does uh, Fox News frequently uh, on the liberal side against, uh, against the uh, conservatives on Fox, and uh, now we're going to talk to her about the election today. Uh, Nina. Just one correction, not yes. liberal side. I try to be a down the middle journalist. Okay, I get it. Wait, well, that's a, we'll get back that's to that. Very important. I, I, we'll get back to that. Well, I just noticed yesterday that Dick Morris, the uh, great prognosticator, is suddenly saying that this uh, election is back up for grabs. Do you think he has any point? I think there's no. I think I think what it is is that conventional wisdom has set in, but sometimes conventional wisdom is right, and I do think that the House is going to flip. And I think uh, if you talk to Republican strategists you know, privately, they'll say the same thing. I do think the Senate, however, is up for grabs. I think that's a very iffy proposition right now as to whether the Democrats can gain control of the Senate. Would you care to predict because this is going right on to videotape how many seats? How many seats in the House? Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit reluctant. It sort of it, it depends on whether this becomes a nationalized wave, and we're talking then we're talking you know 30 or more seats, or whether um, these are just more localized elections. And then you're talking the, the Democrats, of course, need 15 to take control. And then it, it, if these are more localized elections and people are voting on local issues, which a lot of Republican candidates are trying to make their races about because they they don't want to talk about the war in Iraq. They want to um, talk about local issues. And if that's the case, I think um, you'll see fewer seats gained by the Democrats. Well, spoken like a down-the-middle journalist. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the argument by many in the blogosphere, myself included, is that that, that uh, bias is as natural as breathing, and that to claim that you're down the middle is only a claim. But you you dispute that. Well, I think you can be. I mean, I I resist being called um, liberal. Some people think I'm conservative. What I like to be is smart and surprising, and you know, offer fresh insights. And I'm a journalist, and that is my. Um, and I, I consider my a journal myself a journalist when I appear on Fox. And I, I do think you can be down the middle. I, I think um, I do. I do think there's an inherent bias, but I do think that that we see in the press, I, um, and I think you see on uh, on air as well. But I also think you can strive to be down the middle and see things with fresh eyes and not come from an ideological perspective. I try to challenge conventional wisdom. And uh, in the 90s, I wrote a book on the rise of the conservative movement at a time when my liberal colleagues in the press didn't consider them a major force. And so I, do, I think what happens is if, if you do bring a bias to your work, you miss big stories that are sitting right in front of you. The rise of blogs is pretty well documented. How do you think that's affecting, uh, here we are, we're in the offices of Time Magazine, How you, the most kind of conventional of conventional media. How do you think that's affecting this situation? Well, I think um, in a couple ways. I think blogs pr provide a tremendous amount of new information, a tremendous amount of like new perspectives. Um, but I do think that there's a danger sometimes in blogs that uh, they're not held to the same standards that we are. They're, you don't have to be fact-checked. While I think they're incredibly valuable, I use them all the time, I read them, um, I also think that we are held to certain standards, uh, particularly in terms of facts have to be right, uh, that blogs aren't. And I think that adds a whole new element to the media. Well, I, I, I would dispute you on this, and here's how I dispute you. Uh, I... Uh, have a long life as a professional writer, uh, mostly in screenwriting, but I also wrote for the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, various times. I was fact che I am fact checked more rigorously on my blog by the public than I ever was by fact checkers, uh, uh, because um, commercially and economically, no organization can afford that kind of fact checking. Right. I, I think that's. I, there is something to be said for that. There is a sort of self-correctional nature to blogs. I think that is absolutely the case. But, you know, writing, I write for Fortune magazine, and, you know, you do go through every story with a fine-tooth comb before it's printed, before mm -hmm. it's out there, to make sure, you know, facts are right. Now, you, people may not agree with the perspective that piece is coming from, but, you know, it, it's gone through some kind of editing and fact-checking process that I think is getting lost in, you know, and, and probably on, on you know, uh, on air as well, and in, in, in cable shows and so on. 
Yeah, well, we were wrestling with that in Pajamas Media because, of course, we're evolving from mere blogs into a kind of media thing, and we're editing as well. But we don't edit our bloggers. We edit the pieces and the audio and the video that comes in. So it's an interesting combination, and I think it's a, uh, a question to be resolved yet. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's, I mean, it's all evolving, and it's a, you know, it's a huge, exciting um, a piece of media right now. And, of course, uh, newspapers and traditional media are suffering for it economically. Well, we hope not too badly. Thank you, Nina. And we hope we, you're not going to be among the unemployed, and I hope I'm not going to be among the unemployed. Okay, thank you.